Welcome to Reboot Cyber with a Virtro, the boardroom series. Hi everyone, and welcome to this episode. I'm Ian, founder and CEO of Avertro and your host. For today's topic, we're focusing on pan-regional perspectives on cyber leadership effectiveness, specifically here in Asia Pacific. The International Telecommunications Union releases their cybersecurity index each year. In the latest edition, the US and UK rank one and two respectively. But there are a few Asia Pacific nations in the top 10 scores. While Singapore ranks fourth, Australia is not even in the top 10 and it ranks behind countries like Singapore, Korea, Malaysia, Japan, and India. I should note that the ITU Cybersecurity Index does not uh, measure cyber resilience, rather it measures each country's commitment to cybersecurity. I've worked across the region in various roles over the years, so I have a perspective on the commonalities as well as the differences. And today we're privileged to be joined by two esteemed guests who also happen to be on a Virtuos Executive Advisory Board. Each will be providing their learned experiences and opinions on the topic at hand with a focus on their part of the world. And in no particular order, because we don't play favorites here with our advisory board, we have Jamie Norton, partner in the technology and cyber team at McGranicle and former chief information security officer of the Australian Taxation Office. And Jerry Cheng, ex big four ASEAN lead cybersecurity partner and current founder of his own consulting business, helping clients with cybersecurity, AI and emerging technologies. And both our guests have a longer CV than I've outlined, but I'm sure you're capable of uh, searching them online rather than listening to me tell you about the life story. So welcome both, and thank you for joining us. Cheers. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask a couple of questions of you, but I, let, let's just start the discussion off, and maybe I'll start with you, uh, Jamie. What, what does effective cybersecurity look like in an organization? What, what are the key indicators? I think, uh, for me, it comes down to culture and, and really... Um, having that, that that culture of security and that accountability um, and, and really I think needs to be at that executive level of the organisation and at the board level um, and, and then permeating from there throughout the organisation. So I think that's what represents, um, you know, represents good, good security. Um, for me, the indicators are things like that visibility of security at the board level uh, and, uh, and having that accountability and ownership at that level. Um, the mature risk approach to across the organization is one of those indicators as well. And, and I think um, having mature risk is, is a key part of, of, of cybersecurity. And I think you've got things like cyber strategy is the other piece there and organizations having an effective strategy is, is a key indicator uh, for me. Jerry? Yeah, personally, I think that um, effectiveness needs to be measured against the current landscape that we're in, right? So if we look at the landscape, uh, that has changed quite significantly in the last few years. Things has uh, become uh, a lot more data-driven, uh, infrastructures have changed. And as we start looking at it, it's really about a lot of uh, automation and, and algorithms that a lot of the hacker groups are working on as well. So I think beyond looking at how we have been dealing with security previously, I, I would feel that um, effective cybersecurity today is something which needs to be able to scale uh, without just putting in more people because uh, the lack of resources, uh, people, uh, you know, how much you can spend, it's always going to be a factor that, that uh, constrains it. So the ability to scale, uh, being agile, and uh, the, the ability to then uh, act on the inside. So all this will then require things around uh, re-engineering the way things are done, uh, looking at where technology can help. So I think, I, I, in, in my views, I, I think those are the key areas in which uh, we should be measuring effectiveness uh, at this point on. And I'm going to stay with you, Jerry. I mean, what does what does an effective cybersecurity leader look like? Well, first and foremost, I, I would say the individual has to be a business leader first, uh, first and foremost. So, um, you know, gone are the days where we view security as just a very pure technical topic. You need to be able to explain to the stakeholders, the senior management, the boards, etc. So, first and foremost, is really being, uh, you know, that business leader. But beyond just bis uh, being a business leader, there's also the need to understand technology. And 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 I'm not referring to the need to you know uh, uh, directly have to roll up your sleeves and, and get the work done, but understand the technology and the implications sufficiently to be able to lead the teams uh, to look at you know what are the changes which which are happening, um, how is that going to have an impact to the strategy and the businesses, and then lead the teams to really re-architect the way security is done. So it's it's not an easy task, you know, a business leader to, to begin with, and then understanding technology enough to lead the teams. Jamie? 
Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd echo Jer- Jerry's comments that um, you know has to be a business leader who's comfortable working up and down the hierarchy from from the board and the most senior parts of the company and all the way through to those technical areas and is comfortable talking technical language, um, but also has to be comfortable talking strategy, risk and governance as well, because they're increasingly, well, they are very important parts of, of the role of the size and making sure we get that right. Um, understanding the challenges, I think, is one of those, one of the, I guess, the the advantages of size I can have is understanding the challenges that, that'll face them because they're, they're um, going to happen in the role when you enter, you know, it's a size of a large organisation and being able to advocate for cyber and the right outcomes, I think, is key and overcoming those challenges. And I'll stay with you, Jamie. Uh, we, we're talking about cyber leaders here, but on the flip side, you've got, you, you both talked about business leaders and, and the importance of a business leader, which means a lot of the times the stakeholders they have to deal with progressively moving forward are senior executives and, and board members. And for the senior executives and board members who may be listening in, uh, what part do they play in ensuring they are enabling their secret teams to be effective and what should they do and not do? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, organ- cybersecurity is an organisational issue and I think it starts at the top. So the board and the senior executives have to have accountability and ownership of, of the problem first and foremost. Um, and, and they can really help the CISO by enabling the CISO to provide uh, you know, good visibility across the organisation into what the cybersecurity posture is like, um, but also um, helping helping the CISO really with that cyber culture across the organisation, I think, is key. Um they also should be requesting that that strategic insight from the from the CISO as well. So, um, and having them um, provide the information you need to understand what the current state of cyber is like in an organisation, what the strategy is, where, where the organisation is going, and what its um, what its goals are, I think is is essential um, things to be asking a CISO, but also providing that enablement for the CISO to be able to perform their function. Um, the other, the other part of it is, is really being on board with cyber risk as well. So understanding what the current risk position is for your organisation, um, understanding where, what the journey looks like and where you're going to get to and providing the funding necessary to address those risks um, and not just making it the size of problem. Jerry, I mean, I, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just uh, give you a bit of nuance. I mean, how much of that do you see being relevant in your region? And, and are, there, are there specific bits that you believe are more important or important? when it comes to the senior leaders and board members in, in Asia, for example? 100%. Um, as you were asking that question and, and prior to JV answering, I was thinking three, three key things in there. The first is really about staying informed, uh, subsequently demanding insights and then providing the support. So so it's it's really that, that same thing where we are starting to see a lot of boards in Singapore, which is uh, requesting for access to uh, technologies uh, savvy or cybersecurity savvy people. So if not at the full board, at least at the audit committees or the risk committees, they, they are indeed asking for uh, you know memberships with uh, people who are uh, knowledgeable about those areas to help advise the committees and the boards in, in those areas. So having the the right uh, you know awareness about what is happening around. Um, I, I agree with what Jamie was uh, mentioning as well, right? Demanding the insights. I, and I think that's a very important aspect of it because the tone, we always talk about the tone at the top. What is this tone at the top? And I think that the tone that needs to be set is demanding not just you know data, but what insights are we able to get out of it? And, and when we put the two together that I have the awareness about what is happening and I'm getting the insights from the teams about how things are being being run. These are parts where the, the two can then come together, that uh, knowledge really happens in, in there, right? And, and therein, that's where the third point about being able to provide the resource. I, I did mention earlier, you know, this whole thing about um, not enough people, not enough money, it's always going to be a problem. So that the key thing is, how do I prioritize the limited funds that I have? to be able to better secure uh, if we view things from a risk perspective. So what should my priorities be? So I, I absolutely echo you know, what has been said, same things that we have been seeing here in Singapore as well. Yeah, so I'm going to stay with you, Jerry. Uh, we, we, it's, it's really easy to say all the right things people should be doing. But obviously, we, we have some challenges in, in accountability in terms of alignment. Is there a specific story you can point at or that you can share that speaks to the accountability challenges we have as security professionals that make it a little harder for us to do our jobs properly. 
Um, without naming, for obvious reasons, without naming specifics, uh, I think over the past few years there has been enough uh, incidents that's been happening. And some of the, these incidents have then uh, gone much deeper into some of the investigations on what went wrong. Um, I, I like what Jamie said earlier about culture, right? Because a lot of it does boil down to this whole culture of, is it my problem? And, and there's always a lot of finger pointing with, when the investigations uh, go deeper into it, that there's always a lot of finger pointing of that was not part of my job scope, I, I was not enabled sufficiently to be able to get the, the work done, etc. So I think that there is really quite a lot of work that needs to be done to uplift this whole uh, a feeling of you know um, cyber security being really everybody's job. It, it doesn't just sit with the CISO or the office of the CISO uh, to get that done. Um, and I think as everybody starts pushing the digital agenda uh, faster and, and with scale, it needs to be really embedded into everybody's uh, you know, radar in there. So, so I would say first and foremost, it's really about uh, that culture setting and then uh, the few points that we've spoken about on the support. Jamie? I think one that springs to mind for me is quite, quite topical given recent events, but uh, some years ago now, I was working for a large global health provider and uh, we um, or, or they came up with what's, what was called a situation room which was about health response um, and providing health response in the, in the example of, of a pandemic where we, we find ourselves now. Um, it was a, one of those decision points that was made by the exec and it flowed through to all the project teams and they built this this uh, wonderful and, and obviously quite expensive um, facility but that completely left security out of the discussion until they asked me after that always that almost taken delivery of this and, and locked the doors to come and do a security assessment and tell them how to make it secure so they could have you know global health data from different countries sitting in there and um, you know it only occurred to them after I'd had the conversation that this is something they should have baked in from the start and I, and you know it was almost impossible to do this now you know two months after the the, the final you know building had been had been completed so um, even though that was many years before the current pandemic, it still highlights an issue we have in security that, that often security is forgotten about or it gets left off and we charge ahead with, with business goals, but um, we really need security to be embedded culturally in, in everything we do so that it's got a seat at the table. Um, otherwise, we you know we find ourselves not, not being able to build security in and, and that has implications in terms of the usefulness of some of the things we build. I, I, I guess it's a nice thing with the next point, right? We, we, we often, say it's other people's problems, but we have to take some accountability as an industry on our own. Um, do we think it's, it's it's just, we just have some ways to go in terms of building or training more cybersecurity leaders, or is it really a systemic issue? How much of it is uh, a, a system we have to change? And how much of it is we just need better cybersecurity leaders to, to be able to make this a little bit easier for us as, as an ecosystem to deal with? Uh, I'll start with you, Jamie. Yeah, I think the right expertise is certainly challenging, um, and and there's no doubt that that more experienced professionals have the battle scars, and they understand, you know, where, where to push and when not to push, and how to how to make things happen and advocate for security because of most likely having failed previously and, and the battle scars to prove it. So there's, there's certainly an element of just not having enough professionals in in you know with the right level of um, experience that can that can work this through but i think that's st still the majority of the issue is is a systemic issue with organizations um you know cyber is still very much viewed as a technical problem that sits in the it domain and is a you know something that the tech guys have to work out and sort through um you know there's, there's that lack of ownership and and um, concern often at, at a board level or, or where there, where it's a agenda item it's often Either a tactical item or it's a, can be dismissed fairly quickly. Um, so there's not the appropriate level of um, consideration at that point. Um, and I still think we, in in many cases, we still have funding constraints for cyber because the strategy is not right, and we don't have the right linkages between corporate risk and enterprise risk and cyber being just another part of that broader risk environment at the executive level where decision making should be made. It's it's still seen as a as a risk or something that can be can be pushed out of the technology space and and dealt with at that level. And Jerry, are you seeing very similar things over in Asia or are there slight? Very differences? similar things as well. Um, in, in fact, I, I would say that it's a combination of many factors in, in there, right? Um, 
one of it one of it is uh, fundamentally in terms of uh, the individuals still using a very old paradigm of what used to work in the past and then they're still trying to manage today's uh, risk which is a very different landscape today they're, they're still trying to manage it using what has been tried and tested worked for for you know many years and decades in, in the past particularly if we look at you know whether we look at uh, maybe things like compliance audits etc it, it is always a point in time uh, kind of snapshot a rear view mirror if, if you may on what has happened and and with the volume and velocity of things which is happening today you know those models of uh, working just doesn't cut it anymore but yet on the other hand there are also constraints around um, it, it is a catch-22, right? Because the individuals are stuck in the old, way of, old ways of doing things, they may not necessarily have the uh, resources, whether it's time or money, to uplift, upskill themselves in, in the new emerging area. So it becomes that vicious cycle that I'm stuck in doing the things the old way because I couldn't pick up the new ways and uh, re-engineer some of the things in there. And, and I think to, to that point, it, it is a systemic issue but individuals have to also want to step out of the comfort zone, knowing that the paradigms that have worked before is not going to serve well uh, for us in, in the future. And I mean, which brings us to the next question. I'll, I'll stay with you, Jerry. Uh, part of the challenge we have is, is making senior leadership really care and board members. So many of them say they care because it's what they're supposed to say. Uh, but we all know there are a lot who perhaps don't really mean it. What have you seen that really makes senior leadership care about cyber risk instead of pretending to? Mm. If, if, if we look at that, it's, you know, I, I'm going to be very disappointed having to say what I'm going to say next, but regulations and law seems to be the ones that really pushes the, the needle. Um, I mean, in, in the geographies that I've worked with, uh, exactly to your point, right? There, there are, it always starts with a lot of good intentions, but always there are a lot of priorities that, that uh, come ahead eventually. Um, but when regulations come in, when it becomes an act of sorts where there is that accountability uh, right at the top, then that's where we, we really see that um, it gets taken very seriously. So I would say regulations uh, do prove to be very useful in uh, at least setting that right foundation and a culture and the only hope is that the only hope is that once this is there it is not done because of of uh, regulations but people are then able to build um, the right foundations and then being able to do it in a more sustainable manner and jamie I, you, you've written a few blog posts in the past uh we did a cyber leadership effect in the study about strategic approaches versus compliance based approaches uh so i mean i i know you've had a lot of thinking about this and, and publicly been on record and saying some things but what, what's your perspective particularly uh with the australian lens on yeah I, th I think there's undoubtedly nothing like a good crisis to get the executive uh engaged and and that's certainly one of the ones that that we've been involved with at McGraw with with ransomware and other things that that certainly is one approach it's not, not ideal to have that hit the first time there's a, there's a major crisis but um i think as as jerry said re regulation does create a measure of of um account well, not accountability but a measure of um concern i guess at the executive level um as i've been on record stating you know it, in australia it's not a particularly effective way of generating the right kind of results and we've We've sort of had some you know, empirical data to prove that um, organisations can be less agile, but by taking that approach, um, I think the most effective really is is having the dots connected for the executive. So rather than treating cyber as just an issue that sits in the technology domain, actually having them understand um, the the current risk posture within the organisation and and the strategy and maturity around cyber, and actually connecting those dots for the executive, so they they understand the, the risk position they're in and can make decisions or, or conversely not decide not to do things, but they understand the implications of that. So it's that insight, which is, which is critical and it, and it can be very, very hard to give that to the executive and make sure they understand that. But I think that's, that's the challenge for security is to give the executive and the board those insights to make that decision and get that, that buy-in and accountability. And I mean, staying with you, Jamie, look, we, we acknowledge that being a security leader is hard given all the things you've both been talking about, but I'll stay with you because I mean, my next question you, you you were most recently prior to McGranical in a very, very highly pressured situation. Obviously, there are things you probably can't mention given the role, but having been recently a, a chief information security officer yourself, right? 
I'm sure there are a lot, and I've spoken to some uh, who I won't name, where it is a very tough job. And some do, if they're not already burnt out, uh, are headed towards burnout. Um, so let's 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 explore that a little bit. And Jerry, from your side, you've also obviously consulted to a lot of uh, senior security leaders. But if I, I I can ask you, Jamie, for a second, I mean, how prevalent do you think CISO burnout is, and and why does it happen? I think it's it's absolutely a real thing, and it's it's more prevalent. Uh, than, than we might think. Um, there's also the ability for CISOs to, I guess, hold the fort whilst without really charging forward. And that's also a measure of burnout in its own right, where they're kind of, you know, struggling to really get a, continue that energy. And you need a huge amount of energy to, to really drive forward some of the changes that you're trying to do. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for it. One is just how wide CISOs are spread. It's one of the few functions in an organisation that touches all parts of the organisation. So you end up getting caught up in almost end to end, um, and and it's very hard to scale to that to that to that size. You don't really have one sort of niche area or, or one vertical that you can compartmentalize around. So, so that's one of the aspects that definitely drives workload. Um, you're also dealing with the most senior parts of the organisation, and and that's where you'll find, um, you know, the highest level of expectation, the highest level of sort of work effort and preparation required, and and you also have to roll with the punches and deal with with the rejection or the um, you know the, the expectations that come with that as well. So that that certainly takes its toll. Um, and and the third piece really, I think, is that if if you aren't getting the results that you're trying to get, and you know you're coming quite ambitious into a role, and and you'll find if it's more complex and you're really struggling to get some of that change, it can be a little bit disheartening. And, and combined with everything else, that's where you start to see burnout coming in because um, sizes get frustrated. Um, and so which I think is is one of the many reasons why we see CISOs, particularly in Australia, every sort of 18 months to two years, they'll skip job to job because they'll they'll reach a point where they feel like they can't contribute anymore, suffering potential burnout. So they'll look at something that's that's a bit more sort of green uh, green grass across on the other side. And and if we move across the region, I, I think the interesting, the interesting lens on this is obviously cultural differences, right? So I think probably in Australia, in a more westernised society, we're, we're probably quite more, a little bit more open about these things, probably not as open as we should be. But uh, if I if I think about Asia and, and being born there and understanding the culture, a lot of it is to put on a brave face and to show face. So Jerry, do you do you think this is as prevalent in Asia and people just don't admit it? Or what what is your perspective and having spoken to a lot of senior security leaders in that region? Yeah, we're, we're seeing the same um, here as well, right? I, I've recently been talking to quite a few clients and uh, recruiters as well who's really been asking for uh, references to, to people in there. So so there is in, indeed that vacuum, which is also created, uh, you know, with uh, people experiencing the burnout and, and moving on. Um, absolutely echo all the uh, comments that um, Jimmy has made as well. One one of the interesting facts recently, I was talking to a client, he was mentioning that the average tenor of a CISO is about 22 months, 24 months thereabouts. So very much similar to uh, what Jamie has been mentioning in there. And and a lot of it from what I've heard really does boil down to that frustrations as well about um, the increasing you know task which, which is at hand that needs to be handled. But yet on the other hand, it's the lack of um, the, the support and the resources that's coming in to, to get the work done. So oftentimes you would see that some of the um, resources, whether it be team uh, members, whether it's be budgets, get funneled away to something else, uh, taking away from the, the security aspects of, of other areas. And, and that leads to you know, quite a bit of frustrations where the expectations from the board is there because they have been reading about all the, whether it's a ransomware attacks, the hacking uh, incidents, et cetera. And the, the expectations comes down on the CISO, but yet, they are not getting the necessary support. Um, so it can be a very frustrating experience for them if we do not deal with that systemic issues that we were talking about earlier. And and the next, the next question is sort of related, but it's a change of pace, right? So we talked about compliance, we talked about strategy and different levers that cyber leaders have to lean on sometimes to uh, get the board to care or get others to care. One interesting one uh, is is buzzwords. Um, and, and they, as much as we like or dislike them, they sometimes matter depending on what is, is happening. So I'll start with you, Jerry, given you are, you're currently educating yourself very deeply in the areas of, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So my question is, I mean, do, do you think, or do we think that leaders really care about these kinds of buzzwords? Do they not care? What kind of, what, are, what kind of perspectives do they have 
and and I get that uh, Asia may have a different perspective than Australia, but just interested in your views from from a regional perspective. Yeah, I, I would say that a lot of the senior leaders that I've been talking to are a little bit more skeptical about this buzzwords, and and precisely the the reasons why I uh, kind of really went a lot deeper into the AI aspects of things is that I, I felt that you know I, I'm an engineer by training, but I felt that it was an abused term and buzzwords used by too many sales and marketing people. Um, but having gone deeper into it to understand the potentials uh, that there. There are really, uh, you know, good use cases that can be applied in there. In, indeed, I would argue uh, that moving forward, you know, we talked about the scale and agility. Without the use of data and algorithms, it is quite impossible to deal with it. So some of these buzzwords are important, but but it is important to also then uh, cut away, you know, from just the sales and the marketing terms, but really think about. Uh, what the implications are for the organization. So recently in, in some conversations with the clients, it's it's that debate around, you know, what do we do with, do we try to reinvent everything? Obviously the answer is no, because there are some vendors who have already done it. We might be able to procure or to use some of the technologies which is there. But then you have to worry about, you know, the proprietary nature of it, the data that has been trained on, does it make sense in, in your context and environment? And therein that's where, you know, moving beyond just the marketing and the sales, you know, just by saying that something is machine learning, it doesn't change anything. You need to be able to understand, you know, the specifics of what exactly is being used, what kind of algorithms are being built up before you know contextually, is it something that makes any sense to you. So some of these buzzwords definitely, I think, had its uh, promises, um, but I think we got to move way beyond uh, just the sales and marketing terms to really benefit from it. And Jamie, I mean, I, I guess from your perspective, very, having very recently probably been on the receiving end of a lot of salespeople throwing buzzwords at you, uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think from a uh, from a security leadership perspective, yeah, it's something that, that we've had um, considerable amount of buzzwords that are thrown at, you know, thrown at us over the journey. And I think we've almost become a little bit immune to those, um, you know, from, from vendors and particularly if, if buzzwords sort of the key part of the sales strategy. And I think uh, that they don't have the impact they maybe once did at, at a security leadership level. Um, it's perhaps less pronounced further up the the hierarchy and, and sort of anecdotally from my perspective, there was certainly a, a, a resonance of buzzwords at the very senior exec level. And, and I often think that I did get asked about, AI or machine learning or things we can do in that space. So um, that that was, I guess, developing a little bit at the senior exec level, and, and at least in, in from my experience, there was some interest in, in adopting some of those technologies, um, go, you know, going forward. So um, I, I'd say that the buzzwords do work, do work, you know, in, in Australia to a degree. I think it depends on the perspective of the execs though, and, and they're, they're leaning towards implementing sort of emerging tech or or whether they're more conservative. Okay. Uh, and final question, um, I mean, I'll, I'll ask each of you to, to put on your uh, regional hats and maybe not specifically compare your countries necessarily, but Jamie, I'll start with you. Maybe if you, if you were to say what the similarities are in Australia, for example, versus the rest of Asia Pacific in terms of cybersecurity and the differences. And then Jerry, uh, the difference between ASEAN versus the rest of the Asia Pacific, very similarly. I think it will give our audience a, uh, a nice perspective on how much of a lived similar experience we can have together versus understanding the nuances in the various parts of the region. So Jamie, I'll start with, start with you, compare and contrast. Yeah, I think uh, Australia's, it's, at a corporate level is still, we're very much in that um, developing awareness phase at, at the executive level. You know, there's been um, a, lot of, a lot of movement in the last 12 daily months around ransomware, and that's certainly becoming a very big concern across organisations. But in terms of education of the board and, and developing um, cyber awareness, that's still, I think, a journey that we're, we're going on um, at, a, at a governmental level. There's a, there's more progressive regulation there, but again, it, it's very compliance driven, and we're, we're sort of making that journey from compliance to to risk based. But it's a bit of a slow progress uh, in that space. Um, in terms of the corporate sector, re regulation is something I think that we're we're, we're having that discussion now, um, and I think in other parts of the region, uh, regulation is perhaps more pronounced in terms of the obligations on on executives and boards. Um, that, that discussion, I think, will, will lead to some greater regulation and we, and we certainly have critical infrastructure in other areas that, are, that there's a focus on as well. So I think it, it, it's, it's a discussion that's happening. It's, it's perhaps still, you know, a little bit in its infancy in terms of the, the general awareness and concern, but I think 
it's it's progressing, uh, but perhaps we're not we're not quite as developed as some of our regional neighbours in that space. Um, and we haven't, I don't think we've seen the threat until very recently in, in terms of um, the, the implications it can have. So I think that's one of the issues we've got in, in Australia is that we haven't had that threat focus until you know until the last few years. And and in ASEAN, it's a, a very you know diverse group of uh, countries with uh, different you know maturity levels and uh, different stages of its digitalization journey as well. Um, but but I'll say that one common uh, thing that is quite apparent here is really you know that focus on the compliance as well as the regulations. Which if if we look at it uh, in the context of one of the earlier questions, it does have its benefits in driving uh, change. The problem with that, however, is that people get stuck in that whole regime of viewing it as a, a tick in the box, you know. And and if people don't move beyond that mentality, then it can be a very dangerous uh, thing in there. Uh, what we have seen as well across the region, because of this uh, deferring maturity and the state of implementations, there is this potential, I'll say, for some of the countries who who may seem to be slightly further behind today being able to leapfrog further ahead in, into the future. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, compared with some of the uh, more mature countries that have, you know, built up huge infrastructures over the past, that becomes a baggage when we're talking about a lot of the more agile technologies available today. And some of the more emerging countries have the potential if they want to and with the right leadership to really start building a lot of capabilities uh, using things, for example, like in the cloud, right, where they don't have to then worry about how do I uh, then migrate from the existing infrastructures because they don't have a very huge baggage to begin with. So we're seeing a very deep, a very wide range of um, you know, maturity levels. Uh, but moving forward, I, I do see that there is actually a very huge potential for, you know, quite a quite a bit of disruptions uh, coming forward in this region as well. Okay. And with that, I mean, I found that uh, wholly fascinating. I'm hoping our audience did as well. Um, and with that, I'll bring that to a close. But uh, thank you, Jerry and Jamie, for your time and for joining us and for providing us with your insights and wisdom and, and with all your experience. And to all of you watching, thank you for joining us. And until next time, see you later.